All right, and we're live with Aiden. How are you, Aiden? I'm doing well, thanks, Sunny. I really appreciate you having me today. Cool. I'm excited about our conversation. I'm not going to lie. I uh, I usually like to start with where we met or where we first maybe encountered one another. I'm thinking it's probably meetups, right? Back in, do you remember the time frame? Maybe like 20... 20- I mean- I'm not exactly sure when, if it was a Bitcoin Bay meetup or mm. potentially one of your events that you would host. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm maybe one of those. Sure. <laughs> yeah, so what, back in like what those, like 2015, 2016 maybe? No, probably 2016. I right. was 2016. Right. Yeah. Hey, were, you, were, you, um, uh, were you ever visiting kind of like the decentral space? Not too like the much. House? No, not, not too, too much. much. Yeah, no, not at all. I mean, I wasn't in Toronto. Um, oh, you, so, interesting. Okay, yeah. so I, so maybe let's just get to that then. Let's let's get to your your you know your story. Um, yeah, we just start there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, going backwards, I was really fortunate to have incredible friends who were into the tech really early, um, or even before it was tech and when it was just you know digital gold um, and got introduced to everything and really got super excited about the community side of things when I started to go obviously to the different meetups Um, and what really hooked me was the Ethereum developers meetup Um, and that's when it became clear that this is something that you know I want my entire life to be Um, and so I met one of my uh, co-founders there and basically it all just kind of took off from there um interesting and so was your first exposure to crypto ethereum then like or i guess like your major exposure it was definitely bitcoin so it was before ethereum but that was as a kind of friend of someone who was you know everyone has that friend who was trying to get them in early into bitcoin right and so i had one of those in uh in 2014 And so it wasn't really until my, my, one of my other co-founders started mining Ethereum that um, my exposure really kind of grew beyond just a speculative asset. And I just really started to want to learn more. Um, And around that time, also just started going to different meetups and just getting a, a better sense of what it all meant really and, and, and so what was when what was your lens kind of coming into this space then was it it seems like you were more of like a tech person right like you were more in, intrigued by just computers and programming of the sort or was it I mean, really mm-hmm. yeah it's a good question i mean honestly at the time what really excited me the most was the fact that we could codify uh, agreements law uh, things that were you know not really taking to tech um, so for me, it was actually the non-tech side of things, you know, the potential for decentralized autonomous organizations, um, the potential for impact on regular life in a way that really would disintermediate a whole group of people, of actors that are really sitting in the middle to ensure that people can understand things or are understanding things correctly. And I just personally felt completely blown away by what those possibilities could mean, you know, where you as an individual could enter into some kind of partnership agreement or some kind of, you know, creation of a corporate entity of some kind um, at, you know, the fr- a fraction of both the cost and um, both, both actual cost and, and mental, you know, cost of, what it looks like to start a company in the modern world. So for for me personally, I was mostly excited about the legal side of things and what this technology can do there. Um, Obviously the economics as well, Um, you know, streamlining so many of the things that we take for granted here in Canada. Um, However, yeah, I mean, it was really that the the potential for DAOs. You know, that was one of the major. Uh, to talk, Aiden. So I remember. I mean, I remember the DAO back in the day. But I mean, I remember just the idea of it. However, like preceding what actually ha- ended up happening in that case was just 
mind boggling. It's just fascinating, right? And I guess it could be argued that now, I mean, if you had to point to a couple of like maybe operational DAOs today, what, what would you say the best examples of them are? And maybe even after that, um, explain what DAOs are because I, I agree. I think they're a fascinating idea. I think a lot of people have question marks around them, but you know, I mean, to me, it seems kind of like how the future will most likely work, right? Sure. I mean, my car already drives itself. Like, why yeah. wouldn't, you know, you have other decisions being made um, autonomously. For sure. Yeah. So a decentralized autonomous organization is really a different way of looking in at what a corporate structure could be. And I think um, the best way is through example. And I think the, the two biggest examples that I would look at are MakerDAO, um, which um, people kind of might know through DAI, um, which is a stable coin that utilizes Ether um, as a collateral base. And so, you know, things such as, um, you know, all decisions basically within that um, system are made through um, the holders of the Maker token. And so it's a really incredible project. And I believe they just hit a $1 billion die milestone. Um, so $1 billion in die has been created, I'm pretty sure, um, through this DAO. And so it's quite an achievement. And then a, another really exciting project is um, Aragon. Uh Wait, 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 Aragon. Okay, we before we go to Aragon, can you talk a little bit more about like what makes MakerDAO a DAO? Sure. Um, yeah, because I'm sorry, I'm so intrigued by this, and and I get it, but I, I don't, first of all, I don't even think I like get it to the way that I maybe should, and I, I'm sure a lot of other people would be interested. For sure, and what makes them a DAO is that the decisions of how to govern the platform are coordinated through um, the actual platform itself by token holders. And so token holders are able to make proposals and vote on proposals, which are then binding to the system itself. So for example, um, different rates of things and you know, different kind of um, structures are able to be decided upon by the community themselves. And so we're looking at Aragon, for example, Aragon is and this gets pretty meta they're a DAO that also builds frameworks for building DAOs and so for example one of their projects Aragon Court um, it basically utilizes a token that allows for people to arbitrate on different outcomes um, and that is currently being voted on merging with um, the actual ANT token. So right now the community is voting on what could be seen as one of the first mergers in the DAO world. And so the, the implications on what this will look like for the future of organizations is pretty incredible. And so Sonny, you brought up quite an interesting example, which was, you know, my car can drive itself. Well, you know, one of the incredible uh, use cases that's always been discussed is that, okay, once we do have vehicles that are fully autonomous, what is stopping a collective of people buying a bunch of these cars and then opening something or starting something like a decentralized ride sharing company that then utilizes the DAO structure to then facilitate the economics and company side of things um, for something like a decentralized ride sharing app. And so you can imagine, you know, what the fees and what the costs um, would be decided upon by the DAO if they should purchase new vehicles could be decided upon by the DAO. You know, all of these different decisions that go into a company could be decided upon by a DAO. Now, there are obviously limitations as to what is possible. You know, there are is usually a real world organization that is tied to these protocols um, for you know a bunch of different legal reasons that I'm not going to go into today. Um, however, you know it really does lend you know to a side of creativity that um, we really could only imagine in uh, 2015, 2016. 
Uh, okay, so I guess let's uh, let's keep going with uh, your story. I guess in terms of so what happens next? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. So we meet uh, we meet. You're you're into this Ethereum thing, <laughs> or Bitcoin thing. You learn about Ethereum. You're you're fascinated by kind of the program programmability. Is that even a yeah, word? Programmatic <laughs> programmability. logic. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the fact that you can put code on a decentralized network and not have it be in any one place is fascinating. Um, and and then and then it's really this idea of a DAO, which you know captures your imagination. Which I got to admit, it's it's uh, yeah to to think that it's now becoming an actual reality uh, is pretty fascinating. And then now to think that there are mergers of them is even more interesting. It's wild, uh, and oh, it's hard yeah, to and really so um, look at it from anywhere outside of just pure curiosity because um, you know where these things are going and how they evolve are still you know open questions right but the fact of the matter is is that there are people on the ground that have dedicated to their lives to pushing these things beyond the boundaries that anyone ever thought would be possible and that is just so exciting to see and just so inspiring to see by so many different projects, right? There are countless other DAOs that exist. Um, and there are countless other examples of projects that are utilizing these frameworks. But yeah, going back to the story, um, you know, so my one uh, co-founder was my best friend from high school. So him, I already knew. Um, the other, yeah, we met at the Ethereum developers meetup. And then another, um, we met at the Bitcoin Bay meetup and I remember he had just moved to Toronto from Halifax and you know it was I think just around uh, Christmas time um, and we both don't celebrate Christmas and so the Bitcoin Bay meetup was very very small at the time um, even though it was you know around a, a a lead up to what became 2017. And so there were a decent amount of people that were showing up at that time, but it was just around the time of year where there weren't very many people. And so I noticed, you know, this is a guy I haven't seen before. So we started to talk and I learned that he was a developer. And so, you know, he had just graduated and um, yeah, I, I told him, you know, come to the Ethereum developers meetup. I think you'll, it'll be more kind of a crowd that you'll, be able to talk to and, and connect with just being that they're developers. Um, and he actually listened, which a lot of people didn't. Um, and yeah, he, you know, is one of my co-founders as well. And then another, we met, um, you know, a few months later through the community as well. Um, and so from there, we, we basically, oh, co sorry, uh, sorry, you didn't interrupt a co-founder of what? I don't think we've even, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So I, at chain safe, we're a blockchain research and development firm and what, so, that, so when, what was the birth of that then? So when did you guys launch chain safe? Uh, I mean, we, you know, spiritually and legally <laughs> are two different dates. I like to say, <laughs> okay. I like to say in February of 2017. Um, but legally it was in may of 2017 um so yeah um at chain safe we're at the moment a 45 person blockchain research and development firm and our goal and mission is to build out the infrastructure for web3 so to build the things we believe are necessary to catapult um this new internet and so and what's the story of chain safe been uh yeah i'm curious to learn about that yeah. And so, you know, that is basically the origin story of us all meeting at these different, different events and coming. And Bitcoin together. Bay, is that the one by Antoine? That is the one. Okay. Okay. Antoine. Okay. Cool. 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 And then okay. at the time, the Ethereum developers meetup was run by Ethan. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, that was just a huge importance for us to come together is having these community events. I mean, we always used to go to your events, Sunny, um, when they would happen at Mars. Um, yeah, like the, those were, you know, big parts of, of our, you know, story. Um, and so, yeah, right now, what it looks like for well, us. I, you know, I was gonna say, why was that important? And and it's, it is like kind of a common theme amongst almost everyone I speak with. It's like er, almost everybody at one point or another, 
wherever they are on planet earth, they attended meetups. And that's when, you know, it kind of became real um, despite all the research that they've done on their own. But why do you think that is? Why, why is that such an important factor? And uh, yeah, and I guess the follow-up question would be like, how does one do that in, in this new kind of world, right? <laughs> For sure. I mean, I I would say one of the major reasons that was important for us is that it connected us, right? It brought us together. It it taught us new things. Um, We were able to hear from people who were already in the space full time and really just to learn from them what they were doing and how they were doing it. And then for us to be able to understand how we could do our own thing, you know, differently. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, for us, it was just a real taste to what this community looks like, um, practically speaking, but also, you know, realizing how much there is still to be done, you know, in seeing how little there was at the time. Um, and this is already, you know, 2016, 2017. And at the time it was, though, you know, we all felt it was much more accelerated than it was. It was still a good reality check to see how much left there was to do. I still remember the pizzas and samosas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So you guys are attending these events, you're meeting, but I mean, what, what, uh, what, you know, comes out of that? I mean, because a lot of people, again, um, are just comfortable watching <laughs> from the sidelines, which is fine as well. But part of my thinking behind doing this, whatever the heck this is, is to inspire people to to take action, right? And and given that we're all stuck at home. Um, you know, I thought this would be the best kind of way. And, and I felt like a central part of it was um, conversations, like whether it was like the conversations on stage or off stage or, you know, people conversing among one another about things. I felt that was the essence of it. And I didn't, I don't need to spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on like hotels and like three course meals or, you know what I mean? Like crazy um <clears throat> and be like limited to physical boundaries but um but i hope someday we can get back to it aiden <laughs> i'm yeah. not gonna lie i miss it <laughs> definitely i mean you know uh you you really i know it's so cliche to say but you know you don't appreciate how important these things are and even for people like ourselves you know we tell ourselves that you know we like to be focused and heads down on all of these you know things but you really realize um, how much you just tell yourself at the time that, you know, there's so much going on, but really that's, that is everything, um, is that, that human connection, right? There's so many companies that have said, you know, they're moving away from things like, um, in-person, you know, events, uh, their offices, things of that nature. But I really do believe that, um, to do what we do in a, in this collaborative world, it is those, you know, connections with individuals that really kind of allows us to learn more about each other, explore new ideas and take our collaborative kind of curiosity to that next level. And so, yeah, I I couldn't agree more. I'm I'm so excited to get back to it. Um, But also in due time, um, I don't want to rush it either, especially here in Toronto. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, yeah, it is what it is. And just it's just best to make, you know, the best of it um, while it's here and then and then enjoy, you know, events, in-person events when they're back. Uh, exactly. the next- and really appreciate them and really appreciate and be thankful for those those times and, and to take advantage of every minute that we have together, because I think it's hard to in the in the moment without having such a global pandemic to truly appreciate how how much we we do want to be around one another in person. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, just have you att- been attending virtual like events? I mean, I haven't really been like these things with hundreds of people at them, and you, I don't know like even how they work really. Like, are you walking into like virtual rooms and stuff? Like, have you tried any of these or? Not so really? I've spoken at a couple. Hmm. Um, how is it? What's the vibe? Yeah, it's been interesting. Um, I, I think they've been really successful hmm. and that, you know, some have taken advantage of really cool technology. Hmm. Um, we're actually hosting one cool. um, early December. Um, so if anyone's interested, please go to cscon.chainsafe.io. Um, and we're going to be using this cool platform that exactly, as you said, allows you to have a virtual floor 
Um, so we're going to have um, two floors open per day. Um, one of them is like a networking floor and it's really built out like a um, like an actual conference. And so it, it's supposed to give you that feeling of being together in a really cool space. And so we're hoping to bring people together. We have people talking from all the different partner projects that we work with um, and we contribute to. And so we're really excited about what that's going to bring. But yeah, I mean, we've used a whole bunch of different technologies Hello. for this. And I personally think that it's a really effective way to also just generate, you know, information for people because irrespective of who's attending these events, recording them and putting online is a way that, you know, we disseminate this information and the news mm. of what is going on to so many different people. So it doesn't matter how many people show up to the actual live online right. event. At the end of the day, it's more about getting that information out there to the people who do want that information. Yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. So, so Aiden, what? Uh, so, I guess, yeah. So, what, what, what happens with? Uh, I guess you guys, in terms of you know your your story with uh, with Chainsafe now. So, you start this company, you're like, okay, we got to go do something, you know, something meaningful, something impactful. Um, but how do you make those first few moves, or how do you take those first steps? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a really good question. And it, it happens pretty organically at the time. Um, and, you know, for us, it was just about seeing what projects we feel like we could contribute towards. Um, and it really kind of took off from there when we started, you know, building out open source infrastructure that we wanted to see in the world. And so we're lucky to be from Toronto, where a lot of this is from. And so the first ETH Global Hackathon happened to, to be at ETH, uh, in Waterloo, ETH Waterloo. And that kind of was definitely a good place for us to be able to, you know, build out something that was open source um, and something beyond what we were already doing. And to try and kind of build on top of that by, you know, working on bring that open source to more people by having also people who wanted to support that open source software. And at the time it didn't really, you know, it, 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 it was just a, a project that was looking to turn um, USB keys and other types of um, uh, devices that had memory and otherwise weren't really being used for anything into one time use cold storage devices. Um, so it wasn't too, crazy and the goal was you know there were a lot of projects at the time not a lot there were a couple projects at the time that were basically making one-time use cold storage devices where you were supposed to kind of either break it or pull off a seal or do something with it and we thought hey we could probably achieve that same thing with a software solution and that was kind of what we built ETH Drive, and from there we really started to realize that you know we shouldn't just be building things um, with the intention of, you know, having it only affect a specific niche of the, of the that and try to build as much for long-term impact as we possibly could. Um, and the first project that we really did. This. All right, we're back, Aiden. Sorry about that technical difficulty. No but yeah, you were just finishing telling about this very unique software solution uh, to turn any USB storage device into a one-time, you know, key. Uh, that, that that's really interesting. So I, I, never, I didn't I didn't know about that. So what happened after that? So yeah, after that, I mean, we just really tried to look at what we can do to really impact people beyond just specific projects. So we had started working on also at the time, some really exciting projects, um, you know, one, one DAP and then a, a blockchain um, based on a, on a specification where we were extending um, op codes to GEF. And, you know, at, around that time, um, ETH 2.0 was beginning to become a reality um, in terms of what the new direction has been um, for the past two years. And we realized, you know, this is something we have to contribute towards. Um, you know, if it's really organizations, small organizations around the world that will be, you know, building out this infrastructure. And so, you know, we're, we felt a duty to be 
you know, one of those organizations that begins contributing um, as soon as possible. And yeah, I mean, that turned into a two year journey um, that we're just starting to kind of see um, take take flight with, uh, you know, the deposit contract being released and everything starting at the moment. Um, so yeah, that was an incredible journey. And really for us, you know, the beginning of, of truly having as much of an impact as we possibly thought we could um, with the projects that we worked on. And, you know, from there we started, well, this is obviously not two years later, but, you know, shortly after that, we started working on Polkadot um, and building out a Golang implementation of the Polkadot host. Um, from there, we started um, contributing to Ethermint and becoming the maintainers of that, which is Ethereum on Tendermint using the Cosmos SDK. Um, so, you know, a proof of stake Ethereum with on-chain governance. And beyond that, we started contributing to Filecoin with a Rust implementation of the protocol. Um, and so, you know, the, most of these projects really did start from us seeing a technology that we wanted to contribute towards and that we saw, you know, having a massive impact on our ecosystem. But even to take that a step further, realizing that without these projects, there will be no ecosystem. Um, and so, you know, it's, we've always felt that, um, you know, we're trying to basically accelerate the adoption of our industry by the world, by contributing to all these different projects and bringing them um, as much as we can of ourselves. And so, yeah, that's been kind of the, those are the major kind of projects we contribute towards um, and you can check them all which, out. Which one, can you sum them up again? So I heard, so sure. Polkadot was one of them, um, which is, I, I'd love to, I have a couple of follow-up questions on Polkadot and just kind of, anyways, but Polkadot was one of them. And what was the one before that you said? Yeah, Lodestar. So an implementation of, um, of ETH2 mm. um, and really all the developer tools that surround that in TypeScript. Um, so a lot of the tooling that people will use um, and since then, we've also started to maintain Web3.js, which um, we're going to be kind of adding, you know, an ETH2 flair to. Um, so you'll be able to kind of utilize Web3.js for ETH2. Um, and yeah, so then there's Gossamer, which is an implementation of the Polkadot host. Um, so I guess, let, let's, sorry, let's start, maybe start with ETH2. So what, what are the things that make ETH2, I guess, better than ETH? For sure, yeah. Um, well, first of all, there's a two after it step one well, that definitely counts okay <laughs> no i'm just kidding um you know the big the big thing here is is changing consensus um to proof of stake from proof of work which is to me one of the major reasons i was interested in ethereum over bitcoin back in the day outside of DAOs was the fact that you know the computational load on verifying things wasn't as um intense um and didn't result as in as much waste in my opinion um so that's one sharding is another and so splitting up the way in which um execution happens across lots of different shards and so you can think about that in a traditional database you want to break things up um so everything is not just coming in out through one um database and so similar notion there so those are the two main I guess, you know, improvements that make it a completely, you know, a new paradigm for what would will be possible, both from a um, transactions per second perspective and from a security perspective as well. Um, and, and have other blockchains already done this? So sharding and staking uh, successfully and which are the kind of the best examples of these you know, these two things being tested at scale or will ETH2 be, ETH be kind of the first one embarking I mean, on that? I mean, um, there isn't really anything other than Bitcoin at the scale of ETH. Um, so, you know, it is something like proof of stake we have seen successfully work with a whole bunch of chains. The ones that we contribute to are Cosmos and Polkadot. Hmm. But definitely um, a sharded, proof of stake chain at the scale of Ethereum has never existed because the only bigger chain is, is Bitcoin in terms of value um, that it's storing. 
So yeah, I mean, these are really exciting things to be working on because there is, you know, such a high level of impact in terms of what will be possible versus what is possible. Um, so yeah, we're still kind of, you know, a lot of these things are still being worked on. Aiden, what is the biggest kind of argument against staking? Um, is it the fact that it does present a, a, like an attack vector of sorts? Um, or, and, and if so, I mean, I guess what the first question would be like, what is kind of the biggest criticism or would you say from a technical perspective um, against staking and, and has the kind of the industry proven otherwise already with some of the staking examples out there? Yeah, like I would say it's mostly ideological. The mm. arguments against it. I don't really think that there are technological arguments against it at this point. Mm. Um, you know, there are pretty successful examples already of proof of stake in action. Um, so yeah, I, I do believe that most of these arguments at this point are mostly ideological in nature mm. and that, you know, certain people want things a certain way and other people want things another way. Um, so I do believe that at this point, the tech has proven itself beyond um yeah beyond just you know a feeling that this will be the way to scale blockchains however there are certain blockchains like filecoin that need a need proof of work um in that they are you know literally storing people's um files or storing people's you know data i should say more generally and so there is always going to need to have you know a proof of work layer to you know, a lot of the major blockchains. Um, and so this is not to say that proof of stake is better than proof of work or anything like that. Um, there is, you know, it, it's just a tool for a specific um, problem, I would say. Interesting. Okay. And then, and then Polkadot, like how do you, yeah, I mean, how, how does it differentiate? At least from like people that I've talked to, it's they're, they're, they're usually, a lot of them are saying that it's essentially a 2.0 to a large extent, but better, but, but I'm sure you can comment further, but how is it, uh, how is it different? Sorry, I don't yes, know the I would details. Absolutely, I would absolutely, um, you know, disagree with that. I'm sure you would. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, to say that is kind of like saying, um, you know, yeah, I can't even make an analogy to the Bitcoin. What are the benefits of Polkadot over Ethereum or vice versa? Or what are the, I guess not over, but like what are the applications that, that Polkadot maybe is better suited for? For sure. So Polkadot is, is, you know, you could think about it as a ecosystem of blockchains that are all kind of um, stemming from uh, the relay chain. So the relay chain is what you see as the dot kind of backed blockchain, which its main goal is to basically anchor a whole bunch of different chains that are called parachains. And, you know, they're all following this traditional uh, hub and spoke model that you see in computer science. And so the relay chain is the hub and all of these parachains are spokes that all can utilize what's called shared security from the relay chain to act as their form of basically um, verification for what it is that they're doing. And so what that allows for is interoperability across these different blockchains because they're all able to route through the relay chain. And as well, what that allows you to do is not have to worry about things like a validator set. And so a validator set in proof of stake is kind of like the miners and proof of work. Mm. And so to build out a validator set, to get all of those people to you know, stake your chain, it can be cumbersome for certain people. And they might want to take advantage of this notion of shared security, where they don't have to worry about staking, really. All they have to worry about is um, leasing a slot, which is what then allows you to kind of fall into this ecosystem. Um, but also there are other kind of requirements. Um, and that is basically what the Polkadot host is. The Polkadot host is basically all the components um, outside of the runtime itself, which is where the state transition logic will lie, that don't need to really change much. So it's things like networking, things like the database, things, 
you know, um, like consensus that you really don't need to worry about as an application specific blockchain. You really shouldn't have to worry about those things. You know, if we're moving to a world where anyone can build anything. Um, and so really this model allows for, um, yeah, just an acceleration of building a blockchain. And so looking at Cosmos where, where they're very different is that they approach this hub and spoke model um, in a different way and that they're empowering, you know, individual chains, sovereign chains to not from the ground up needs to take advantage of something like shared security and rather, you know, work out the trust between the different zones, which is what they uh, call the blockchains in their ecosystem, you know, like parachains and polka dot. Um, however, again, you know, that is, it is not a requirement for those zones to utilize shared security. And there are kind of different levels to that in Polkadot. There's um, full shared security as a parachain and there are pair of threads, which are a whole different thing that allow you to not necessarily need to utilize shared security all the time, but rather whenever you want it. Um, but that's a whole nother thing. But with Cosmos, the idea is, to, is more to start from a sovereign chain perspective where you are worrying about your own validator set and that you know you might want that for a whole bunch of different reasons um and i think it's yeah. public knowledge right that that binance uses cosmos or i think there's some article about it but binance's yeah. dex essentially uses cosmos because uh, like you said it's there's like there's trade-offs in the sense that bitcoin is solving for money um whereas <clears throat> some of these other blockchains are, are solving for the decentralization of financial applications that may or may not need the same level of uh, decentralization so in the case of a, a dex you know it might make more sense to use something where they're uh where it's maybe not as decentralized is I, mean, that's I, kind wouldn't, of the... I wouldn't use that terminology again like, mm. i think that that's uh, citing on mm. on these the ideology side. of ideology yeah <laughs> okay um, help me help yeah. me get through this <laughs> <laughs> i would say decentralization is a spectrum like most things in life right it's not a binary thing right um, a lot of bitcoiners will disagree obviously and say you know decentralization is x and i i personally believe that you know if that is the case i mean how decentralized was bitcoin at the beginning when there were only a couple people that were mining it right and so yes like you know it's great to say that Bitcoin is sufficiently decentralized now, but even then, I mean, look at Bitmain and manufacturing all these ASICs, correct? Um, you know, there's so many ways we can dissect what decentralization actually means mm. and what the output of that looks like for an ecosystem. And so I don't really like to engage in these ideological conversations about what is decentralization, rather what, you know, aspects do we see or how do we see decentralization taking form in these different communities? Um, and so I would say rather why someone like Binance would want to take advantage of something like a hub and spoke model mm -hmm. is that they would like to see the proliferation of different products take form in these different spokes surrounded by their hub. Um, and so there are other hubs as well in the Cosmos ecosystem like IrisNet. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, this model kind of makes sense for scaling beyond a single use um, project or product like something such as Bitcoin, right? Which is just, you know, a digital gold or what have you. Have you ever, have you ever met uh, like Diego and these guys over at RSK? Have you ever yep. looked at it? I'm just curious. Interesting. I mean, we, I mean, I, I've definitely learned about it, heard about it, but um, I don't really know. So, so I guess I was going to ask you, so one of the questions I like to ask is like, what is, I guess, like one truth that you hold that you think most other, let's say Bitcoiners would disagree with you on. Um, I almost can kind of guess what your answer would be, but do you want to help, help kind of sum it up then? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I would say that, you know, one of these truths um, is that, you know, a lot of these things are still being figured out right now. The fact of the matter is to say that 21 million as a circulating supply is just the truth for monetary policy and nothing else can make sense for people or that, you know, this notion of a um, initial distribution 
is unique to non-Bitcoin blockchains when there were a group of people who mined Bitcoin before others at a rate that was, you know, way beyond what is possible today, um, even though now there are more people and that rate of return is diminishing. I think these are things that, you know, people need to, you know, be really honest with themselves and, and ask themselves, why do they think that 21 million is the answer for monetary supply? And now I'm not saying that it couldn't be. I'm just saying that to decide right now that these are the things that determine sound monetary policy and or uh, peak decentralization, I think is just a bit um, a bit short sighted in that there's just so much experimentation left to be had. And so let's enjoy you know, these early years with as much of an open mind as possible to what is and could be possible if we work on it together. Wow, that's, uh, that's well said. I like that. I like that. Um, okay, so what about what about outside of like, I guess, crypto, blockchain, Ethereum, Polkadot, all this? Um, any any truth you hold that that you think most people would maybe disagree with you on, but I don't know that you see as uh, kind of obvious. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a tough one because I think there are so many. Yeah, um, but I I think one of the the things are really around open source and how fortunate I feel that I get to you know work every day with an incredible group of people who are building things that anyone can really utilize and take for their own needs every single day and how much that is a business model in tech that can make sense in creating a network effect beyond what is possible if you close, you know, if you build the walls around your software. Um, I really do believe that open source is a model that can make sense for so many different projects and so many different platforms, uh, products, um, you know, all the different types of, of angles people are building software for. And that, you know, to me, it feels like being able to, you know, paint something and not only sell it, but also share it with so many different people at the same time. Um, so it's, it's definitely a, a massive privilege, I feel, every day to be able to share what I do with the world. Um, without them having to ask for permission. Yeah, that is pretty, uh, pretty awesome. Hey, I was going to ask you another question is, is are you, do you think much about, uh, I mean, the word AI is kind of overused, but like, I'm not talking about like narrow bands of AI, but like, I don't know if you've uh, read much about like general AI and this notion that, you know, well, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are talking about now and whatnot, but but have you have you toyed with that idea? Have you ever I don't know heard about like the technological singularity and all these ideas around this coming of something? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, f for me personally, what what excites me so much about just you know beyond AI, but just the reduction in or the diminishing cost to um, uh, to actually building things right and creating of things. Right, like what does a post-scarce world look like for humanity? Right, a, a world that doesn't have to worry about the cost of manufacturing, the cost of food. Um, you know, we already basically live in a world that has much more than we could ever need to feed everyone. Um, yet we're really kind of just doing it all backwards. So, you know, what excites me so much about all of these things and all of these technologies is moving beyond. Uh, scarcity and moving towards post scarcity, which is going to be this new world that, you know, we live with not just abundance, but um, what we need, right. And so I think abundance and over consumption is, is really the issue. So that's what really excites me about, you know, things like AI is that, you know, with more and more, um, you know, of a reduced cost to manufacturing, we are moving towards a world that um, can feed itself. Yeah, yeah. And maybe house ourselves and totally. do everything, right? You know, um, 
Yeah, and a cost reduction also seems like a good idea. And have you also, um, I don't know, like, do you, do you have any thoughts on universal basic income? It's something yeah. that's like a bit controversial again, but I'm just curious. Uh, do you think about it much? Do you think blockchain plays a part in there somehow? It's hard to Whoops. say, right? Yeah. Mm. It's hard to say. Like, there are really cool examples of uh, projects that are looking to do different mm. types of, of UBI models. Um, yeah, I mean, I personally believe that giving money to people is better for an economy than holding money in people's pockets um, for as long as possible um, and not kind of transferring that money. So, you know, putting you know money into the people that don't have money and are otherwise unable to participate as freely. If we do believe in a free market, we should be giving them as much opportunity as possible to participate in these these different games and in, in economics in general, right? To have more say than they do right now. So I definitely believe that, um, you know, we are in a position where we can put money in the hands of people that otherwise don't have the things that they, they need. And you can look at this from multiple angles, right? Um, you know, instead of, you know, requiring people to spend money on certain things, you're now giving them the option to do what they want with their money. And so I think that there could be a massive impact there in terms of where that money gets spent and what that signal is for people um, in the in business. You know, I forget what the what the number the number was, but you know, it was an extraordinary amount of money every year gets spent on ATM fees in California on welfare. So the people who get welfare then also have to take that money out of ATMs and the amount of fees that that, you know, generates for banks. Um, I forget what the number was, but it's a astronomical, right? And so I definitely believe that cheaper ways of directing capital from one person to another will definitely have an impact there. But, you know, one of the things that I like to, to make clear to people is that technology doesn't solve people's problems. People solve people's problems with technology. And that's definitely something that as technologists, we like to play, you know, into the savior complex that really is not real, right? It's, it's people that solve problems together and potentially are utilizing technology to achieve those means. But no technological solution will ever solve the world's problems, um, you know, just in a, in a blanket kind of way. And have you toyed with OpenAI or G GPT-3 or whatever they call it? I, I haven't. I've seen all the, like a lot of the cool projects. Mm. Um, how about yourself? I... Uh, I mean, I've just, yeah, read about it, heard about it. Um, there was one thing by, I forget the guy's name, like a Bitcoiner, Mar Marzon or some guy from Argentina, I think. He posted this post about how he ran all these tests using GPT-3. He generated all these um, like blurbs and put them on Bitcoin talk. <laughs> and supposedly it was doing really well. And it was like this whole blog on uh, how it ran this test how he ran this test. And then at the end, uh, it's like dot, dot, dot. It's like, by the way, that blog post was not written by me. <laughs> that entire idea, I haven't been on Bitcoin talk in years. Um, I just fed it like these three lines of like information. This is who I am. This is my website. These are the things I do in life. And it literally went out and, and generated 10 versions of this story. And I picked the one that sounded most like me and, and, and posted it. So that was just like, interesting. Okay. Like, where are we going here, Aiden? Um, I don't know. Or, or, or I guess, I guess where are technologists taking us, you know? And, um, and, and so I guess this world where AI is ubiquitous, maybe it means like you're saying, like lower cost of production, you know, post I think post-scarcity was my Twitter handle before I changed it to whatever it is now. That's so I, I definitely, I don't know if you've ever heard of Jack Fresco. Is it no. Jack Fresco? But he talked a lot about this, this notion of post-scarcity. Um, I did find it, however, like once I kind of like started appreciating Bitcoin though, I, I did find, I agree that the 21 million number is a bit, you know, uh, who knows, like, is it the number? I think it's somewhat arbitrary, but I think the fact that it's fixed 
and then the fact that Bitcoin is scarce is a bit interesting. Um, and so my conclusion was that, you know, in order to have a world with, uh, you know, a post-scarce world, you need to have a scarce money supply. <laughs> or yeah, you... I mean, I, I don't disagree with that, right? Mm. But I mean, if you look at, you know, the rate of return for mining, for example, um, yeah, I mean, early adopters got more, right? And I definitely think that uh, if we're not going to be building things that are able to, you know, share in the value creation of these networks. So for example, the people who came in the last now, you know, three years since 2017 that are now leading to the growth that we're seeing today, um, are there, are they sharing equally in the, um, in the actual return of something that is now accruing in value. And then what happens if the realization of the Bitcoiners dream and Bitcoin becomes the, um, you know, Bitcoin becomes the standard currency in the world, right? What happens then when it can only reflect on itself and what you can buy in the streets and not based on the value of the dollar? In, in exchange for Bitcoin, right? So I think we definitely have to look towards a future that's beyond, you know, a self-reflected narrative of certain people having a lot of this stuff. And so, you know, they're able to enrich themselves against the US dollar, as opposed to, you know, being put into a position where they're trying to create utility for these uh, tokens. Um, so that's kind of, I guess, where I feel that the economics don't really line up for a long term uh, value kind of dispersal of some kind. Mm. Um, but again, you know, these are all experiments, in my opinion, obviously massive experiments that are highly successful and, and you know, beyond just um, beyond just a singular experiment at this point, right? There are multiple levels to it um, and, and layers to it. You know, the Dow idea where, I mean, you have these kind of autonomous organizations. That, I mean, obviously that is super fascinating. Do you think that like this tokenization thing eventually comes down to the individual as well? Do you think people will ever have like tokens assigned or like choose like maybe artists or something like just to figure out a way to... I don't know, um, monetize their, their efforts or, or I don't know, do, do, do you eventually see like some sort of like hyper uh, tokenization world or, or do you think it'll go the other way where it'll maybe gravitate towards a few things that make sense for, you know, most people? Yeah, so I've seen three people as examples that you can purchase their tokens and exchange those to tokens for their services um, as individuals. Um, so there are people who have literally tokenized themselves already. Um, now, where that's gone beyond, again, just an experiment is, is left to be seen. Mm. However, um, you know, it's hard to say what the future will look like. Um, I definitely believe that things will be tokenized in a large scale um, by utilizing maybe non-fungible forms of tokens to create a digital ownership of a real world item or to even legitimize a digital item in a way that hasn't been seen before. So for example, why not trade something when trading your skin on, you know, on, on Counter-Strike that has, you know, some sense of ownership beyond the skin itself. Uh, I think that there's a lot to be said about what tokens can do. And that's just the, the you know, the lamest low hanging fruit example, you know, things... yeah, a much better example would be if you use a Starcraft reference. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I see where you're going. I mean, um, I mean, things like art, for example, and even having, you know, fractional ownership of art, which is right now seen as something... Yeah. 
for rich people to be no, able. No, but I heard in the last three months, NFTs are like really taking off. And like, sure. where do people even learn about these things? Or where do I learn about these things? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's like, a are there really specific good projects you're aware of. And, and do you think NFTs are, I don't know, are like, are going to become increasingly important? Absolutely. I definitely feel that the tokenization of real world assets and or digital ones in a way that is consumable by people is going to be a massive part of the digital revolution. Um, so what that looks like, you know, whether it is the fractional ownership of art that can then allow for a wide group of people to see uh, value gain from things like art that are typically hidden behind walled gardens. Of, of you know rich people's collections or being things on starcraft um you know whatever that looks like you know we can also see but like why would i want to own a piece of an art like isn't the whole point of like art is like i have this piece of art like at home type of deal like like okay now i own you know one one millionth of the mona lisa but the mona lisa is still sitting elsewhere right like why would even people i mean not all art just sits in museums and a lot of art that does sit in museums also gets uh also generates value for the museums by getting rented out by different uh museums as well so i i definitely think that there is value that can be shared by a wide group of people and mm. then a lot of art is sold right a lot of art mm. is is actually on on a on a live market all the time and so i don't see why that shouldn't be democratized further um, but again these are just small examples of yeah, yeah, yeah. really what is possible um just cool uh, Aiden, so anything else, man, like that, that maybe, I mean, by the way, I, I would love to do this again if whenever you're free. This is super fun. I know today I was, was more around your story and chain safe, but we could, I, I just have so many questions and I'm not going to lie. Like I'm a bit, I got my blinders on, you know, when it comes to Bitcoin and I, I think it's served me well in the sense that it's given me something like a, a guiding light in the midst of a lot of, like, you know, this space is obviously filled with scammers and people try to like essentially get you to part with your Bitcoin. And so it takes a tremendous amount of like mental fortitude to try and like figure out like what is noise and what is signal. Right. Totally. And, and totally. so well, I would say this, Sonny, I would say don't forget that every time a new technology is invented or discovered, people will be doing the same thing. Right. And so though we have the internet now, and so these scams seem magnified beyond anything we've ever seen before, I would say that it's the same as any other uh, technology or any other industry that, you know, has a history of um, just people taking advantage of inf information asymmetry, right? And so I, I would say that, you know, most of all, just people should remain open-minded and just remain interested by what brought them here, which was a cool experiment and something that has profound impact on the way the world conducts itself. And so, you know, don't forget the energy that brought you here. Don't forget the aha moment where you felt like it all clicked and allow yourself to be open to what is to come. Because at the end of the day, how can we disintermediate the world by intermediating, our, intermediating ourselves through one blockchain, right? Um, it is, it just doesn't make sense. You know, we're here to disintermediate things, but it's all going to be disintermediated between one intermediary, which is a singular blockchain succeeds. I just think that it's, it's a bit hypocritical to even think about it mm. in any way other than, you know, we are building towards a new internet and that internet can come in many different ways, shapes and forms. And so why not be open to that? Yeah. And, you know, I think um, like I, I just interviewed Anthony. Yeah. Diorio um, as uh, just recently. I think that's going to go live tomorrow. But I, 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 I definitely I definitely listen. I, I, I you know, and, and even benefit, right? Because a lot of the events, as you probably recall, were blockchain events in the, back in the day. And even on Unicoin, you know, we're, we are a multi-crypto asset exchange with Ethereum, you know, right there. And so, uh, but at the same time, I find like, 
by taking a stance, it's it, it able it, it provides me the ability to ask the types of questions I need to uh, to be able to kind of get to the next you know level if you, if you know what I mean. Um, uh, because whereas, whereas if you're if I'm just kind of like well whatever it's all good in the hood, uh, it's it's hard. But I, I but uh, you know um, I just interviewed Nishchal, who's like the founder of Wazirex, uh, which is like one of Unicoin's you know main competitors, I guess you will. They were recently acquired by Binance. Um, and you know, he should technically be an enemy, but like if you watch my interview, like it was nothing but love because we all, uh, you know, and my my goal is to really capture. Um, I, I think you know, all of us at one point or another really felt that Bitcoin kind of changed our view of what was possible, and and many of us have taken different paths, like kind of along the way, whether it be like building brokerages or actual blockchains. Um, but I just find the fact that, you know, Bitcoin did act as a bit of a, you know what I mean? Like as a source of hope that, that, that money and like assets and value and, you know, all that can be done on the internet in such a decentralized way, I thought was fascinating. Totally. So Aiden, anything you want me to ask that you want that, that I maybe didn't? <laughs> was there anything that you'd hoped I'd asked? I don't know. I, don't know. Kind of a um, question, but. I think we got everything across. Um you know, I, I just think, again, you know, one of the major things to remember is, you know, yes, there are incredibly, you know, malicious projects out there that are looking to have you part ways with your Bitcoin. Um, but there are also some incredibly uh, creative, incredibly well-intentioned, good faith actors out there that are really looking to push where this technology can go um, beyond anything most people imagined in 2015, 2016. And so I would say that, you know, it's, it's, it's up to us as a community to work together to really decipher through what is noise and what is a real project. And so to do that, we need to stay uh, vigilant while also being communicative and open to these new ideas together and to discuss them as we see them um, because you know there are so many exciting technologies that i do believe are on the path towards being a vital layer for this new internet that we're seeing being built all around us well that's i think that sounds like a great place to you know conclude i i really appreciate your time i know you're you're super busy working on some incredibly exciting projects. Um, Aiden, where if people want to, I mean, some people are recently like, I, I don't have a way for people to learn about me, but do, do you have a way? Are you on LinkedIn and Twitter? And is there a I'm way on that LinkedIn. people- LinkedIn, I don't use Twitter. Um, and LinkedIn is not necessarily the best place in the world, but um, yeah, yeah, I mean, if, noisy. if you're interested in, in what we're doing and in everything that, or in anything that I've discussed, um, check us out. Um, on GitHub or at our website, chainsafe.io or github.com slash chainsafe. If you want to reach out to me, um, you can always do so by reaching out through my email. It's Aiden at chainsafe.io. Um, I'll probably be regret putting it out there because there's just so much spam internet. Like I, I would say talking about scams, you know, there's more scam internet, uh, scam emails, um, unrelated to blockchain than any of the scam emails I get related to blockchain. So we'll see how this goes. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that's the best way to, to, to get in contact with me. Yeah, no, I don't think you should have a problem with that. Cause I mean, uh, yeah, I will be lucky if my mom watches. This. <laughs> <laughs> I just started well, this yeah. thing three weeks ago. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That'd be great too. But yeah, thank I'm you so I'm much a... for having me, Sonny. It's been such a pleasure yeah. to talk and I really do hope to, to, have a further conversation soon as more of these things come up you have more questions you want to explore with your community i would love to be able to at least try and answer a few of these things i won't be able to answer everything definitely i mean it's it's pretty evident as you can tell that my level of knowledge is fairly shallow and and you know i do think that risk is a function of information and 
control, right? And so the information element is like, it's up to us, like whether we want to listen, learn, read more about um, what's going on. And I think it's kind of our, our, at least I feel like it's my duty to, to really dig in more. So I would love to do this more often with you and, and really learn more, right? Like go deeper on any pick, any one, like ETH too. I mean, the house Ethereum has changed the game, (laughs) you know, in so many ways um, that I did not see. And so, um, so yeah, so I'm definitely, you know, open to to the future. And like I said, you're, you're one of the pioneers kind of doing the the work uh, under the hood, if you will. Um, But yeah, man, so really nothing but respect for you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, man. Much. Looking forward to like physical media meetups again, uh, hopefully sooner than later. And uh, yeah, I guess let's, let's, if you don't have any other, other things to share, we can bring it to a close. Perfect. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Sonny. All right. Take care.